In the middle of the 9th century, there occurs in Irish chronicles and poems a term unknown before the word Laethlin. It appears to denote a place somewhere whence fierce Vikings came to Ireland to plunder. Due to a somewhat similar term, which in entries on, in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries was used for Norway, early scholarship took us for almost for granted that Lathlin was located somewhere in southwest Norway, the original home of the Vikings. Other researchers, however, argued that the term referred to a Viking settlement in the British Isles. Well, there. Uh, specifically in West Scotland. As the evidence is extremely scarce, and both interpretations had their respective merits and weaknesses, here the matter rested with two mutually exclusive propositions and without proof either way. The question where those Vikings came from remained unanswered, and scholars were left to their own devices what to believe. There is, however, an avenue yet unexplored. The Viking Ulafr, son of the king of Leithlin, according to the Annals of Ulster, is an important personality in 9th century Irish sea history, and his origins and activities are of great interest. They point, I think, towards the location of Leithlin in West Scotland. I wrote a paper about my ideas and was about to send it to a journal for publication when I heard that another paper had just been published, this one advocating a Norwegian site. So quite suddenly the discussion had got a new lease of life. Today I'm going to sketch out to you the evidence and my argument. There are four instances of the term Leithlin in the written sources, all dating to the middle of the 9th century, two entries in the Annals of Ulster and two short poems. The first tells of Jarl Thorir being killed in battle in 848. The Irish won, won a battle against the heathens in which fell the Jarl Thorir Tanist, that is, deputy of the king of Leithlin, and 200 about them. The second records the arrival of Olafur in Dublin in 853. Olafur, son of the king of Leithlin, came to the island and the foreigners of Ireland submitted to him. Along with his brothers, Ivar and Algizel, he became king of the Viking kingdom in Dublin. Then there is the quadrain in the Annals of the Four Masters under the year 866, and it sings fearfully of a keen host from fierce Leithlin come to do battle against the king of the great Eda. And finally, the famous lines in the margin of Prisians Institutiones Grammaticae in the Stiftsbibliothek St. Gallen, the wind is fierce tonight, it tosses the sea's white mane. I do not fear the coursing of a quiet sea by the fierce warriors of Lothlin. It seems clear that Leithlin must be a Viking kingdom from which Norse raiders set out to plunder in Ireland, but neither examples offers any indication where Leithlin by, might be located other than it must be overseas. The Annals of Tiganach, it seems, offer a starting point there is an obituary under the year 1103 for Magnus Rielochlan, which clearly refers to Magnus Berlegs, king of Norway. Thus, Lochlan, and by extension, Leithlin too, must mean Norway. Taking the term Lochlan literally and translating it as land of the lochs or sea lochs, this identification seems almost too obvious, considering the abundance of fjords in West Norway. Egon Varma says, quote, Leithlin must have been a small but important kingdom in Norway, so important that the name Leithlin later became synonymous with Norway itself, the motherland in the east for the colony in the west, end quote. More specifically, arguments have been made to locate Leithlin in uh, Lare in Trondelach or in Westfold on the Oslofjord. All these areas are quite rich in uh, Irish objects such as these, uh, this mount found in Gausa near Stavanger in Rugel. Scotland's west coast, of course, is characterized by fjords and sea lochs just as much as Norway's, so Lochlan might fit here just as well. Unfortunately, the argument in favor of a Scottish location is a somewhat laborious one, so I won't go into any greater detail here now. 
The Irish scholar Don Harder Corrin maintains that the specific meaning of Norway for Lochlan was adopted only in the 11th century and argues that, quote, for the contemporary, that is, 9th century analyst, Laithlin slash Lochlan mean, meant no more than the Viking settlements in the British Isles, and more particularly those in Scotland and the Isle of Man, end quote. In fact, there could be a major problem with the equalization of Laithlin and Lochlan. I am not a linguist, so I cannot speak with any kind of uh, authority on this point, but Laithlin and Lochlan are not necessarily etymologically related, and therefore any conclusions based on this assumption are open to criticism. Nevertheless, both approaches were neither proven nor disproven, and the question remained unanswered. Then there were not one, but two new ideas. On the island of Karmöy in Rugalan, the Viking Age settlement and burial site at Avalsnes is reported to have been the royal seat of King Harald Fairhair in about 870 and other kings afterwards. It was situated in an ideal position on the narrow Karmasyn Strait to control trade and traffic along the way. Referring to this advantageous position, Anne Kruse in 2017 put forward the notion that the term Leithlin, or rather Leithlan, means the land along the Leith. Leith is Old Norse and means path, route, or waterway, and is referred to here to the important sheltered passage between the islands and the mainland of South Wales, Norway. Arbeidsnes would certainly fit the bill as a Viking kingdom that was powerful enough to launch raiding parties against uh, the too far away island. But while this is an interesting and thoroughly plausible thesis, there is no compelling evidence that this kingdom was indeed identical with the realm called Leithland by the Irish chroniclers. Perhaps Lathlin was in Scotland after all. To investigate this idea, we need to ask two questions. Is there evidence for the Viking Ting Kingdom in southwest Scotland in the earlier or mid 9th century in the first place? And if so, is, can this kingdom be identified as the Annals Lathlin? For, uh, for this point, the activities of Olaf of Lathlin, King of Dublin, provide some interesting information. Looking at his uh, biography, according to the chronicles, Ulafur and Ivar came to Ireland in 853, assumed the throne of the Viking Kingdom of Dublin, and spent the next 12 years consolidating their position. There is no evidence that they ever left Ireland during this time. But in 866, Ulafur went overseas and plundered among the pigs in Fort Riu. Some years later, Ulaf and Ivar joined forces to lay a siege to the stronghold of the Britons on Dumbarton Rock in modern Strathclyde. During this period, unrecorded in the documentary sources, the Dublin Vikings also conquered the Isle of Man. And according to the Scottish Chronicle, which must be taken with a pinch of salt, Olaf undertook at least one further voyage to Scotland when he was killed in battle against the Picts sometime between 872 and 874. In 873, Ivar died too. There we are. Now, two of these entries, there is an interesting formula in them. Olaf and Aldrizel are reported to have led the foreigners of Ireland, of, of Ireland and Scotland. This is not quite right. The foreigners of Ireland and Scotland against the Picts, and Ivar in his obituary is styled king of the Norsemen in Ireland and Britain. We cannot know what exactly the chroniclers meant by the terms Alba and Britannia, but this obviously is a place other than Ireland. Two other analytic entries give us a hint. In 839, the Annals of Ulster record the death in battle against the Vikings of Aed Macbuanta, the last known king of the kingdom of Dalriata, which was situated in the southern isles of the Inner Hebrides of Argyll. After this, Dariata is never mentioned again in the chronicles. And then there are the, I'm sorry. Then there is uh, the entry in the Annales Bertignani, 
which uh, record years of Norse raids and the conquest of some islands. The Scotty, after having been attacked by the Northmen for many years, were made tributary to them. After seizing all the islands in the vicinity without meeting resistance, they settled down on them permanently. There are no groups of islands in the vicinity of Ireland that could be referred to here, but the description applies well to the Argyle Islands just north of Ireland. It can be surmised, as suggested by Claire Downham, that Vikings were securing a foothold in Scotland as, quote, a strategic precondition to support their increasing ambitions in Ireland, end quote. I don't think it is too fanciful to conclude that small Viking yardens or kingdoms, or at least one of them, have been established in southwest Scotland probably as early as the 840s and that Olaf and Ivar exercised some form of authority over the settlers. Sadly, this claim cannot directly be corroborated by archaeology, though there is a lot of, uh, a great number of Viking sites on, uh, along Scotland's coasts. But it's interesting to, uh, interesting to note that a number of early sites can be found in the islands of Argyll, especially on Colonsey and Oronsey, on Ila and on Arran. These burials, it must be admitted, do not really qualify as indicative of a powerful settlement or even kingdom that was, was uh, rich and strong enough to conquer the islands and then mount raids on Dublin. But there are, on several of the, in several of the richly furnished graves, objects of Irish production, for example, at Carnambarach on Orensee. They demonstrate that those buried here had some contact with Ireland and possibly engaged in raids on Irish monasteries, dear me. The Penanula brooch is of characteristic form of uh, Irish 9th or 8th or 9th centuries, and the other objects are um, Irish reliquary mounds retrofitted with pins to be used as brooches. So having answered the first question with yes, we turn to question two, was this kingdom the Lythlin mentioned in the Irish texts? I already noted that the special uh, that Scotland held a special appeal for Olaf, as according to Ernst, he never raided anywhere else. But there might be a hint in the scarce information we have regarding Olaf's death. The Scottish Chronicle mentioned before reports that Olaf was killed by the pigs in Scotland. And there is a notion in the fragmentary annals saying that Olaf was called home to Leithlin, spelled Lochlan here, by his father, the king, to help fight down an insurrection. Both events, in Norway and in Scotland, may well have taken place consecutively, but what if both entries basically describe the same event, that Olaf was killed by the pigs while fighting for a realm called Leithlin in Scotland? On this assumption, Olaf's special interest in Scotland would be explained. He was campaigning for his father's policies and his homeland against the hostile neighbors, the Picts and the Britons, in order to protect his native Leithlin and to enlarge his domains and wealth. Altclote, the power base and the Strathclyde Britons, would have been next door, so to speak, and its destruction of great importance. Those foreigners of Scotland and the Norsemen of Britain mentioned would have been the residents and subjects of Leithlin over whom Olaf exercised authority and whom he led in battle both in Scotland and in Ireland. And if Anna Cruz's idea is correct that Leithlin was the land on the Leith controlling this protected waterway and its traffic, then this might apply, might apply just as well to the coast of Scotland as it does to Norway. Here there is also a channel which runs between the island and the mainland from the Isle of Skye, or even the Isle of Lewis, all the way down to the Irish Sea, it provides a sheltered route with hardly a spot exposed to the western winds, especially when using the portage across the Isthmus of Kintyre. And a Viking realm located in the islands of Argyll would be in an excellent position to monitor and control traffic to and from the Irish Sea in both the protect protected route and the open sea. As a quick example, this is the view from the Viking burial site at Kildonan on the Isle of Eich, looking down over the narrow strait towards the Scottish mainland, with the ship burial at Sorde Bay in Atnamurchan almost within viewing distance on the other side. To decide whether or not these burials represent 
a Viking kingdom controlling the waterway between them, uh, more research is going to be needed. So I feel quite confident in claiming that there did ex indeed exist by the middle of the ninth century some form of organized Viking presence in the Inner Hebrides that could be called, for lack of information, a kingdom. About its extent, the location of its main settlement, its political organization, and its subsequent fate, we know nothing at all, unless we consider the hypothesis that this was the realm the Irish chroniclers called Lathlin. Then we can assume that it began its existence at an unknown date before 848, when the Arthurian is reported to have been killed in Ireland, perhaps in the aftermath of the Viking triumph and battle over the Picts in 839, and on formerly Dalriatan territory, after that kingdom collapsed. Possibly its revenues came from raiding an island, as well as from the neighboring territories of the Picts of Britain, and from the control it exercised over the waterways between Scandinavia and the Irish Sea. It was the homeland of, Vi of the Viking warrior Olaf, as laid out just a moment before. This is, of course, a hypothesis and a suggestion. There is no unequivocal proof. I do not claim to have answered the question once and for all, but I think I have mapped out an idea of a possible and plausible contribution to a solution of this challenging and controversial problem. Future research is called upon to provide clarity, if that is at all possible to achieve, of Olaf's origin and destinations, his whence and whither. Thank you very much. <laughs>